This is called In an Attempt to Tell a Story, and it begins with a quote from Buckminster Fuller. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word. I say to you, in the beginning of industrialization was the spoken word. One, I feel uncomfortable calling myself a Jewish writer. Two, in radical Jewish culture, secular Jewish practice, Charles Bernstein writes, quote, Jewishness can and even must, in one of its multiple manifestations, be an aversion of identification, as a practice of dialogue, and as an openness to the unfolding performance of the everyday. Call it the civic practice of Jewishness. Three. The first time I ever wrote something that held any hallmark of Jewishness was while I was working on my MFA at the New School. It was a manuscript titled A Familiar Album. I wanted to write something self-contained that dealt with these strange photographs I found in a shoebox inside my grandfather's TV. He had taken the back of his TV off and made it into some kind of weird fire hazard shelving system. <laughs> they were images of my Saba and Sahal, probably in the early 1950s. The photos were of men with trucks and enormous guns, and they were all smiling. My grandfather was in the center of many of the pictures. The manuscript won the New School's MFA chapbook contest, and I remember being sure that it only won because of how Jewish it was. The introductory note that the judge wrote said that she thought the work was a, quote, unusual picture of family. Four, about five or so years ago, I attended a conference on Jewish education for my job at the time in Denver. Jonathan Safran Foer was also there, and I went to a talk he gave at some bookstore. I mention this because during the Q&A, he was asked how it felt to be such a popular Jewish American author. Jonathan responded by saying something to the effect of, I don't think of myself as a Jewish writer, just a writer. Five, last spring I had the honor of reading with Charles Bernstein and Hank Laser at the Sixth Street Synagogue, thanks to Jake Marmer. My parents came and I read for my manuscript Instant Classic. I'd never thought of that work as Jewish, but during the discussion following our readings, it was pegged as being particularly Jewish, and I didn't quite know how to respond. The manuscript began as an attempt to rewrite Milton's Paradise Lost and certainly does contain a great deal of grappling with Genesis, but the origin of that book was not the Tanakh. It was the idea that we are often told what will be good, what movie will inevitably become an instant classic. Similarly, we tend to shy away from things that are difficult, a problem Milton certainly experienced after the initial publication of Paradise Lost. He even, at the urging of his publisher, revised the book to include short prose arguments to help readers enter the epic. Six, I was actually born in Bloomington, Indiana, although I moved to New York City at a very young age. One of my earliest memories is coming home from Montessori school and asking my mother why we didn't have a Christmas tree. Seven, my dad, an agnostic Jew, teaches at a community college in New Jersey. After 40 years in the English department, he decided that he wanted to teach something new. So he joined the religious department and now teaches a class titled The Old Testament as Literature. When I asked him why he would do that, particularly as a non-observant Jew, he said, Jews really know how to do close reading. They're not afraid to dig into a text. Eight, last March, April, I traveled with a group of 24 teachers to Poland and Israel. A few weeks before the trip, I had the following dream. I was walking in Dizengoff Center in Tel Aviv. I knew it was Dizengoff because I used to go there with my great aunt who lives in Ramat Gan. I pass a tattoo shop. In the dream, I can read the Hebrew signage. It said, Psycho Tattoo. I went in and told the man that I wanted to get a tattoo of a, of a hamsa with a pomegranate and two doves inside it. Only the pomegranate would be in color, and I wanted the hamsa to look filigreed like the pendants I collect. I told the man in the shop that the piece should go on my right wrist. I knew tattoos were not something Jews were supposed to get, so I wanted to be able to hide it under my watch. The man responded by convincing me to get the tattoo on my left forearm instead. He said I could always wear long sleeves. He said, there's air conditioning in the summer. When I woke up, I googled psycho tattoo and discovered it was real and in Dizengoff Center. Nine, I still feel uncomfortable calling myself a Jewish writer. Ten, 
In What Happened to Uncle Schmiel, Daniel Mendelssohn investigates the trip he took with his siblings to Ukraine in search of his family's past. He writes, we went, in, we went because we, in our 30s and 40s, are of the generation of the grandchildren, the last generation that will be touched personally by the Holocaust, the last for whom it will be more than a matter of intellectual or historical interest or of moral inquiry. There is, in our relationship to the event, a strange interweaving of tantalizing proximity and unbridgeable distance. We are the last generation to whom the dead are close enough to touch, yet frustratingly out of reach. 11. I wrote an unfamiliar album out of my desire to try to meet the family that lived in those photographs. My grandfather was so eager to give them away to get them out of his television, it became clear to me that if I wanted a story, I'd have to write one of my own. I'd have to imagine why my grandfather would want to hold a gun, who he was smiling for. 12. A large part of who I am, the writer I am, and the way that I process myself is increasingly not easily separated from my upbringing as a, mem as a member of a family without an extended family because of the Holocaust. The only time we talk about the past is in writing, in the filming of my great aunt for Spielberg's Shoah as she reads her testimony, uncomfortable speaking in English, or when filling out the paperwork for my grandfather so he can get money back from the German government via the claims conference, and learning that there were seven additional siblings that no one knew had existed, and they had names, one brother even had a wife and an infant. My grandpa never mentions this verbally, but writes it into the form under the category of family members lost. 13. In my own attempt to write an argument to proceed instant classic, I found myself obsessed with the idea that there was never really a place for me in the garden. While Milton begins Paradise Lost in Medius Res with, quote, man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, my heroine can't imagine a prelapsarian time. Perhaps there never was a garden. 14. My mother moved to this country already a young girl. She learned English through immersion, imitation, being rendered mute in a classroom where no one knew how to say her name. She parroted back the things she heard. She sat on my father's lap in lieu of asking him out on a date. My mother lived on 85th and Flatlands in Canarsie. Her father owned the two-family house with the green awning that covered the garage that hosted weekly post Shabbat sales. I remember sitting on the steps of that house with my grandfather's German shepherd, Rex, every Saturday. 15. There are two tattoo artists based in New York City who apprenticed at the shop in Tel Aviv. I sought them both out and spent months poring over their portfolios. I decided on Guy because I was floored by the level of detail in his work, and his picture felt familiar to me. Always worried about money, once we finally met for a consult, the only directives I gave were that I really wanted a hamsa with a pomegranate where the evil eye usually is. The day of the appointment, he presented his own rendering, a hamsa with a pomegranate and two doves inside it, the pomegranate in color, the hamsa fully filigreed. I never told him about the doves. 16. In the generation of post-memory, Marianne Hirsch defines post-memory as, quote, the relationship of the second generation children of survivors to powerful, often traumatic experiences that preceded their births, but that were nevertheless transmitted to them so deeply as to seem to constitute memories in their own right. She then continues in identifying characteristics of post-memory to posit that, quote, gender functions as an idiom of remembrance. This transmission, a term that increasingly reverberates with the mechanical, is one way that a writer finds his or her own legibility. An example, time and time again in the new field of third generation Holocaust studies, we see that members of this particular generation seek solace in, quote, non-conforming behavior because as grandchildren we need to, quote, stress both close family ties and conflict. For me, this translates as conceiving of a generation preoccupied with empathy instead of symptom. And for me, this also translates into the moment when my parents were able to read my sexuality because it was justified within the clinical of studies of research of my family's past. Suddenly, in writing, in my virtual self, it was okay to be a lesbian. My mother attributed it to part of surviving. 
And I'm just going to read a couple of poems from Instant Classic. And these are all from the end of the book. And this section begins with two quotes. The first is from Milton's Paradise Regained. By one man's disobedience lost, now sing, recovered paradise to all mankind. And the second one is from Gertrude Stein. Let me recite what history teaches. History teaches. <laughs> Instant classic, to know after. Today feel a strange thing, the want to reappropriate a story, allow myself to stay supplicant and revisit the land I decline, an active verb, a decision marker. It isn't the serpent who made me, it isn't the exile, laryngitic opus point, where I lose my voice and regain it, where I might accept there's no clear road down by the side of the mountain, because it's important to rediscover the bath ruins, the scribe who rewrites and rewrites, unaware of all the glass walls, all man noise, deluge, all the instructions of how to fill the boat with or without measuring cups, and an account of all that advice I lost somewhere between the old Genesis story and this new history I want to deploy with all the nuance of a lawnmower or that special kind of inside cycling where we pretend to really just be on a beach without jellyfish or tacky lighting. When I sneeze, I don't mean to draw attention to the space break my real body requires, with or without loincloths, an epic ceiling ritual. It's true I cringe at the thought of an island or a farmhouse, a pickup truck or ladybug. I'm not one to permit entry via man and security gate moments of purity, like the week I did nothing but memoir and my head beat fitful, as if all this backstory harbors purpose, as if I didn't lose my beauty in the body I left behind. Humor is not natural, and my idea of story is this whole thing a digression forgiven by the intimacy of polytheism, byline kind, of disjointed. Binoculars are the real weapon. Instant classic, moderately Baroque. And this is um, after a book by Eva Hoffman called After Such Knowledge. One, in the beginning was the war. In the beginning, not an epigraph or disclaimer. My hair looks thick, again, just unruly, a way to own my own ancestry. In the beginning, I let the ducks go by, repeat the word disenchantment. In the beginning, we were at war. We were all just ordinary form, intent on assimilating, a way to collate questions like, please, why apologize? Why rehabilitate entitlement? A reference point for naming with conviction. My cousins are always among us, a revenue target set by the hatches that never open. Two, in the beginning I didn't understand, robust in my abandonment, what it means to be in family, both inside and outside the double digit pastoral gate. If you blush at autonomy, you'll always blush. In practical, in practice, the promotion of we are not finished, only a precursor to law, a professionalizing of robotic companionship, phantom kitty utterances, white light experience of the activist kind. Technically, silence is a state of being forgotten. Absence is the articulation of sand on the edge of the garden scrawl. Three. In the beginning, I noticed the sound of every sound, the changing of locks a blessing instead of poltergeist, rice under control, the way I give my playthings room to survive what's not in paper wall hanging, narration of mouse pad, antics, clear, assertive scripture. Can't save your you. In the beginning, I wear a ukulele, name my tendinitis, ancient sight, trim my bangs, build an assessment of what we do with our bodies without dramatizing or formal terms like, I should have been a cowboy, or four. Let's rewrite plagues for a reason. Let's take up all the space left on our communal forearm maker bot bust because I talk myself into take myself into the traditional dove trope. I rationalize as manifestation of my need for messengers and rodents, pacifism and heaps of garbage, rats nests of awesome Congress, contact, designate, a parallel Cinderella, useful in her treatment of the verb overcompensate, 
nightfall, fertility. I don't have any hobbies outside of scarring. Substitute labels with epigraphs of my grime, of my let's take on. Five. The crooked playhouse, the pantene enigma, drawbridge party, wig stack. I spend too much time on staff inflections, metered worry. Look in the mirror, see the word overwhelm. Remember, you were once a person without bronchitis, once a body outside of the rainbow flag. And the scab didn't define me. Once I know Sunday, I don't rest. Regret, sweat, come out with sports caps. Plastic dogs say, when will the epic end? Realize infirmary a bridge, a way into refrain, unknowing, refusal to face the face of our garden. All we care about is clothes. And this is the last one. Instant classic on contingents. At this point, I don't care about elevators or conversation. A shopping bag brings the mark on my arm, finally heals, ceases to be constant. Activity transitions to rote implied liability, deliver my subset. At this point, I happen or not, fill ambience with acts, recopy obvious chemistry table deals, vowels overbearing. At this point, I decide to assign bullets. I want to disembody him, it's topical, like, What's keeping you up at night? Or, thank you, I hope that felt safe. Big business briefcasings underscore man's original what about me mantra. It's crescendo, cell space, faux staccato. Turn apple to mango, then giraffe, then why? Am I not surprised by bombings or circumcision? At this point, my interest in sand, dry heat, nosebleeds, man-made needles. At this point, the buzz, a chainsaw in my window. I'm connected to glass more than oxygen, body mass more than hormones, positive pressure monger, tank, respirational. Is it wrong to just want to feel literal, safe? Toxic parts and toxins, my body needs vacuum, carrot, caraway, leeks, loincloth, trouser dance. I don't mean to be indecent or exotic. I am a man who fashions flesh as more suitable than produce. Potencies become mark of defense. I'm too old to hide inside this genie's bottle of common anemia, post-punk shag. There's no record of what we did without visit. I'm climbing some stupid mountain emeritus. I tell him I could live here. Thank you.